Amen. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you here in the house of God. Are you happy you're saved? Amen. Are you happy to be in the house of God? Amen. Let's all stand. We're going to sing number 167. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. 167. We will sing the first, second, and the fourth verse of 167. All hail the power of Jesus' name. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Sing it out. Bring forth the royal Let's all sing it out. Let's really hit that hit that uh, that uh, uh, second verse really hard. Here we go. Number on the second verse. Sing it out. Ye chosen seed of Israel's race, ye ransomed from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown. Won't that be a wonderful day when we can crown him Lord of all? Amen. Number 192, we'll sing all three verses of Ring the Bells of Heaven. Won't that be a wonderful day when we get to go to heaven and hear those bells? Ready? Ring the bells of heaven, there is joy today for a soul returning from the wild. See the Father meets him out upon the way, welcoming his weary wandering child. Healing forth the anthem of the free. Ring the bells of heaven, there is joy today. For the wonder now is reconciled. Yes, the soul is rescued from his sinful way. And is for a new, a ransom charm. Glory, glory, how the angels sing. Glory, glory, how the loud. Tis the ransomed army like a mighty sea, pealing forth the anthem of the free on the third. Ring the bells of heaven, spread the peace today. Angels swell the glad triumphant stream. Tell the joyful tidings, bear it far away, for a precious soul is born again. Glory, glory, how the angels sing. Tis the ransomed army like a mighty sea, healing forth the anthem of the free. Did you, notice, did you notice the words of the second verse where it says, Ring the bells of heaven, there is joy today, for the wanderer now is reconciled. Yes, the soul is rescued from his sinful way and is born anew, a ransomed child. And then it says in the third verse, Ring the bells of heaven, spread the peace today. Angels swell the glad triumphant strain. There's joy in heaven over one sinner that comes to the Lord. Amen? 
Tell the joyful tidings bear it for, far away, for a precious soul is born again. You remember the day you were born again? Yes. Amen. Never forget that, that wonderful, blessed day, the day you were born again, the day you trusted Christ as your Savior. And you put all your sins upon him and said, Lord, I trust you to pay for my sins. And he washed them away under his blood. Praise the Lord. Amen? Yes. Amen. Joy in heaven over one sinner that repents. Well, it's good to be in the house of God. It's good to be... You know what I love about beautiful days like this out there? Y'all say, oh, my goodness, it's horrible, horrible. Hey, we got a building, a nice warm building to protect us. Isn't that great? Isn't that great? Makes you appreciate the building even more. Amen? Amen. That's right. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, let's pray, and uh, we'll get started this morning. Pastor Toller, would you open us up in prayer, please? Amen. You may be seated. Let's take our songbooks again and go to number 130, 130. Yesterday, today, forever. Jesus is the same. Number 130. Oh, how sweet the glorious message, simple faith may claim. Yesterday, today, forever, Jesus is the same. Still he loves to save sinful, heal the sick and lame. Cheer the mourner, still the tempest, glory to his name. Yesterday, today, forever, Jesus is the same. All may change, but Jesus never. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Jesus never, glory to his name on the last. As of old he walked to Emmaus with him to abide. So through all life's way he walketh ever near our side. Soon again shall we behold him, hasten Lord the day. But twill still be this same Jesus as he went away. Yesterday, today, forever, Jesus is the same. All may change, but Jesus never glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. All may change, but Jesus never Thirty-seven, one hundred and thirty-seven. In times like these, you need a savior. Amen. Let's think about these words. We'll sing the first and the last verse of one thirty-seven. In times like these, you need a savior. In times like these, you need a
against the solid rock. Amen. And that's what we need in times like these. Amen. Amen. Let's go to the announcements right quick. Don't forget that uh, uh, Tuesday we have our uh, national election. We have some voter guides uh, out in the foyer. If you would, uh, please, everybody, grab a handful of them and leave them places. I don't worry about what you're voting. I'm worried about other people voting that you have access to that I don't have access to. So if you would, just take them and leave them places. Leave them at convenience store. Leave them in the gas pump. Leave them everywhere, okay? And that just helps everybody just to be, make a bit the best decision. Also, next week, can you believe it? Aren't you, aren't you glad that next week's friend day? Amen? Because then you won't have to hear the announcement about it for the last last few months. Like, Pastor, you, okay, you're beating a dead horse. We're coming on friend day, all right? But there's a few more flyers out there. So if you would, grab a, grab a few. Make sure that your friends and neighbors and everybody know we're going to have a fun time this time next week. So that's next week, November 8th. We're having our church-wide pizza party after the morning service. Friend day. Bring your friends, neighbors. Uh, bring the, uh, the close friends. Bring your acquaintances. Bring your intimate friends. Bring... You know, you know, Wednesday, uh, Sunday night, we've been talking about friends. All right, so let's bring all, all those lists of friends. Amen? And then uh, next week, we're having missionary Michael Saka. He is a missionary going to Papua New Guinea. He is actual, an actual tribal chief of, uh, of, uh, of his people there in, in, uh, um, in Papua New Guinea. So that'll be, that'll be fun. He'll be dressed in a suit and tie. So you don't have to worry about, um, you know, chief headdress and all of that. So, all right. Tribal chief, oh my goodness, what are we going to do around here? <laughs> no, but um, he, he'll be with us. He'll be presenting his work and preaching to us next Sunday night, so, so be, be prepared for that. Also, uh, next Monday and Tuesday, a week from tomorrow and Tuesday, we will be, uh, we're planning to go to the Fresh Oil Conference over in Belleville. So if you want to join us, there's a sign-up sheet in the four-year bulletin board, so please sign up. Also, the Ladies' Winter Wonderland Conference is coming up December 4th and 5th. So, ladies, if you want to participate in that, there's some information on the bulletin board in the foyer and a sign-up sheet if you want to go as well. Be, 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 put this on your calendar. On uh, the week of Thanksgiving, the midweek service will not be on Wednesday. It will be on Tuesday. It'll be on Tuesday. That way we can uh, give everybody more time to spend with your family for Thanksgiving. Amen? Amen. Amen. Um, and don't forget to let Miss Patty McNew know you were thinking about her and wishing her a happy birthday. It's her birthday today. Amen? Amen. Does anybody have a blessing they would like to share? Amen. A blessing? Yes, ma'am. Miss Christian. Amen. Praise the Lord. That's a great praise. Amen. Praise the Lord. That's good how the Lord takes care of our needs. Amen. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. We've been praying for this is this is Richard. Uh, he is here for uh, uh, he got he got saved yesterday. Amen. Amen. Give him a hand. Amen. Good job, Richard. And uh, and he's going to get baptized this morning. Praise the Lord. That's exciting. I'm happy for you. And uh, we've been praying for his girlfriend. She's been, uh, she's, uh, they've not seen each other for about four weeks now. Good. So don't, don't worry. Okay. He's not spreading. <laughs> People, oh, you got COVID. Oh my goodness. No, but uh, uh, just keep, continue praying for her. Oh, I just uh, remember ladies, we have it. We're scheduling a ladies craft night Friday, November 13th. Okay. So put that on your calendar. We're going to do another craft night that evening, so you won't want to miss it. There is a sign-up sheet in the foyer bulletin board. There's a sign-up sheet for everything, so make sure that you sign up for the right thing, okay? Because then, then you, you don't want to you don't want to be uh, uh, committed to come to a. Uh, uh, anyways, so, just, anyways, there's a sign-up sheet on the foyer bulletin board. I'm trying to trying to trying to be a little funny and lighten the air and not be so serious and stiff when I'm doing these these announcements. I always loved announcements when I was a kid because. Pat, uh, Preacher Gray, he he was he would make it was it was funny. It was I mean he'd make jokes and everything. It was like my favorite time of the service. So we'd get to the preaching, I'd go to sleep as a kid. But <laughs> but but as a as a kid, the announcement time was like, hey man, this is the commercial time. Yes, do it. Amen. So ladies craft night, November thirteenth, Friday. Uh, don't 
don't forget uh, to sign up if you want to be a part of that. Amen. All right, let's grab our hymn books, and let's go to number 131. 131, we're going to go through this song twice. It's a short song, Christ is All I Need. Let's all stand. Let's all stand. Number 131, Christ is All I Need. Think about the words. Let us speak to your heart. We'll sing through, through this twice, both verses twice. Christ is all I need, Christ is all I need, all, all I need, Christ is all I need, Christ is all I need, all, all I need, second verse, he was crucified. Let's grab our Bibles, and we will go to our scripture reading at this time. We're going to go to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. And we will read the whole chapter, verses 1 through 18. So if you haven't got your Bible time in today, you can count this as, got me a chapter in, amen? Amen. You can, you, this, you can laugh, you can have fun, you can smile when you're in church, you can do all those fun things, okay? So when, when the pastor says that, hey, if you haven't got your Bible reading in and, you know, we're going to read the whole chapter, then you can just go, ha, 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 that was a great one, pastor. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? All right, all right. Thank you. It, it makes me feel better, okay? Oh, all right, so Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 through 18. I'll read the first verse, you read with me. The second verse will alternate all the way through verse 18. Galatians 6, the Bible reads, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Ye see how large a letter I have written unto you with mine own hand. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised, that they may glory in your flesh. 
But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be unto them, and mercy, and upon the Israel of God. From henceforth let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Altogether, verse 18. Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Brother Tony, would you please lead us in prayer? Be seated. So long, I search for life's truth, enslaved by the world and my dream. Then the door of my prison was opened by love for the ransom was paid. I'm free from the fear of tomorrow. I'm free from the guilt of my past. I traded my shackles for a glorious song. I'm free, praise the Lord. message of a song. Amen. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor Toller. Amen. We're in Galatians chapter 6 this morning. Some think that spirituality is like this. Someone once told a story of a young Buddhist monk who sat outside his temple many years ago, hands clasped, clasped in prayer. He looked very pious and he chanted Amita Buddha all day. Day after day, he intoned these, these words, believing that he was acquiring grace. One day, the head priest of the temple sat next to him and began rubbing a piece of brick against a stone. Day after day, he rubbed one against the other. This went on week after week until the young monk could no longer contain his curiosity, and he finally blurted out, Father, what are you doing? The head priest replied, I'm trying to make a mirror. The young monk said, but that's impossible. You can't make a mirror from a brick. True, replied the high priest, the head priest. And it's just as impossible for you to acquire grace by doing nothing except chant Amita Buddha all day long. There are those in the world who think that that is being spiritual. That that's not what God says. Heavenly Father, we praise and thank you, Lord, for this chance to come to church and this chance to hear from your word and hear what you think. Thank you so much, Lord, for the word of God that you gave us and how it directs us and, and it, it reprograms how we think. 
We're raised in this sin-sick world, and this sin-sick world programs us to think a certain way, but Lord, the Word of God undoes the bad programming and helps us to think in tune with how you think. Well, that's what we want this morning. Lord, I give myself to you. Holy Spirit, I pray that you please fill me. Please, please fill this room with your presence. Teach us something from your word. Help us, Lord, to learn this truth. Help us, Lord, to, to get the right idea of, of ourselves, but then also see how, how we can apply this in our Christian life. I pray that you'd please take control. Lift up Jesus. May Jesus be glorified. May we learn something from your word. Well, please be with us this morning, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The letter of Paul to the Galatians is a letter packed with nuggets of, spirit, of scriptural truth for the Christian's life. This book of Galatians is, has got so many little nuggets. This morning, I want to go through the chapter, this chapter, chapter 6, and unpack it little by little. I want us to, to look at chapter 6, Galatians chapter 6, in verse uh, 2. I want to, honest, there's, a, there's a, a bunch of different verses, like Philippians 4. Philippians 4 is an awesome chapter that has so many truths that, that many men of God can, can bring messages from. Romans 8 is another good one. Psalms 1 is another good one. Uh, just, just, there's different chapters that are packed with truths. Galatians 6 is, is one of those. And I want to unpack this chapter little by little and, and learn something from this, from this chapter. Let's look at verse 2. It says, Bear ye one another's burdens... And so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. This truth that is taught here in this chapter, Paul is telling the Christian that part of the Christian life is to bear one another's burdens. One thing that if you could get this straight in your Christian life and you want to take your Christian life to another level, the, the, the Christian life is selflessness. Okay? The, the unsaved life, the sinful carnal life is selfishness. The Christian life is selflessness, is giving up of yourself, is allowing, allowing yourself to be defrauded, is suffering loss. That is part of the Christian life. That's exactly what Jesus did. Think about it. Jesus, the King of Kings, left his throne of glory, came here to earth for what? For his creation to walk all over him. And so he, Paul is reminding us that this is part of the Christian life, is to bear one another's burdens. Part of the Christian life is to, is to do that, is to bear one another's burdens. That's a great truth. That's a great truth. You know, that'll, that'll keep you from getting angry when somebody, when somebody deceives you and betrays you and uses you. Oh, my goodness, they, they, they took that money. They, just, they were just using me. Well, isn't that what you prayed? Lord, please use me. Lord, please use me. Well, somebody used you. It's, it's, it's tough Christianity, I understand, because it's tough to, to deal with that and get through that. But, but that's, if, we can, if we can only realize Jesus, he suffered those things too. We, how, many, how many Christians, how many people say, oh, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, but they, 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 you wouldn't, you would, if they told you that they were a Christian, you would laugh because you'd be like, huh? Your life? Your lips? It doesn't match up, and they're using Jesus nothing more than a fire escape. Right? Yeah. So many Christians, they, so many quote-unquote Christians, they do that. But Jesus, hey, if they call on the name of the Lord, the Bible says they shall be saved. They're going to be ashamed when they meet him face-to-face -face one day, but they're still saved because God has to fulfill his promise. Yeah. And so Jesus allows himself to be used, even if it's just a fire escape. What, it, what, it, what does it say in, in 2 Corinthians that, that, that a, a man's works will be tried by fire and there'll be wood, hay, stubble, and if they tried by fire, then it says, yes, so as by fire or, or by the skin of your teeth. Just he'll be, he'll be saved by the skin of his teeth, but he's still saved. Yeah. Amen? Amen? Well, God wants us to, to bear one another's burdens and be used, and this is a great truth. This is a truth that if we can apply it in our lives, will help us to, to not have that contention and that bitterness, that poison in our heart because somebody didn't meet our expectations. If you would expect people to offend you and expect people to hurt you and expect people to betray you and expect you people to do wrong, for you, uh, wrong to you, and if they didn't do it, hey, we're doing pretty good. But if you would expect them to do that and then they met your expectations, it's like, okay, I expected it. God wants us to bear one another's burdens. He wants us to live selflessly. Go to verse 7. Another great couple of verses here. 
He says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. This is the great law of sowing and reaping. The great law of sowing and reaping. You know, there's four things about the law of sowing and reaping. You know what? You reap what you sow. That is such a good... It's like, Pastor, that is so basic. But it's true. Just like you plant a seed in the ground, if you, if you plant a corn kernel in the ground, or you plant a pepper seed in the ground, or you plant a, 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 a pumpkin seed in the ground, you're, 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 or an apple seed, you're going to get what you planted. You reap what you sow. And that's the same thing in, in, in the spiritual world. You plant, plant deception, or you plant lying, and you plant uh, goodness, or you plant uh, uh, being a blessing to others, it, it, the crop's going to come in. You reap what you sow. But the thing about reaping law, the law of sowing and reaping is that whenever you plant that corn kernel in the ground, a, a plant does not come up with an ear of corn with one kernel on it, does it? Unless you're in Texas and you plant in our front yard. Did I tell you about that garden that we tried to do in, in Texas? And, uh, and uh, we, we planted, we set, set out this little section of our, of our front yard. You have to understand, in, in suburbia, you don't have much space for, for gardens and stuff. But we wanted to have a garden, so we cleared off one spot of our front yard and tried to, tried to plant some stuff, had it all nice. We labor, and in Texas, laboring in the summertime is labor. Well, we planted some corn kernels, and we would, we would water it, and, uh, you know, there was a crepe myrtle tree, which is a tree natural to, to down there, uh, on the fence line next door to us. And little did we know that we were watering the roots of the crepe myrtles, and so all these crepe myrtle shoots were popping up in our garden, and this little measly, these, these few little measly sprouts of, of corn plants, maybe about, maybe about that tall, started coming up, and we're like, what's this? It's like, it's supposed to be all and then this little ear of corn and, and the only thing we got that year was a was an ear of corn about that long like what a joke like, come on mercy that's the only exception whenever you plant a corn a kernel of corn that's the only exception if you plant it in texas <laughs> you're not going to get very much you might get one kernel on that cob so but typically when you sow a seed it multiplies that one seed has in it the capacity to become a hundred seeds. And then you plant all those seeds, and then you've got exponential growth. Here's another part of the law of sowing and reaping. You don't just reap what you sow, you reap more than you sow. Yeah. Something to think about. You... you you reap good. You sow goodness, and you you sow righteousness, and you sow holiness. You're going to get more back. But the opposite's true. You sow evil, and you sow, sow deception, and you sow betrayal. You're going to get more of that back. How is it going in your life? You reap what you sow. You reap more than you sow. Here's another truth: when you uh, uh, every every year around this area. In the, in, right now, they're all chopping down all the corn stalks. They're going to go through wintertime. And something's going to happen in the, in the springtime. And they're going to go through the fields and they're going to plant all the, all the fields, right? Yeah. Right? That's what happens. And, and, and they're going to go to bed the next night. And then the crops are going to be up and they're ready to go the next morning, right? No. 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 You see, you reap what you sow, you reap more than you sow. You reap later than you sow. And that's where Satan gets you. Because he may tempt you to say, he may tempt you and say, hey, hey, you know, hey, get involved with this. Hey, get involved with, do this, do that, do this. And you think you got away with it. When actually you just planted a bad seed. And it's going to take time. It may take five years. It may take 10 years. It may take 15 years before the crop comes in. And that's the law of sowing and reaping. Second Corinthians tells us another little aspect of the law of sowing and reaping is you reap in proportion to what you sow. Second Corinthians says, He which soweth sparingly shall reap sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. If you, uh, like, uh, like uh, let's take a, a giving to missions. 
Okay, you want to give to missions? Okay, give to missions. But the Bible says if you re sow sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. If you, reap bountifully, if you sow bountifully, you're going to reap bountifully. It's in proportion. And that's a great truth. That's something that, that, that we need to, to understand in our Christian life is that, that especially in the sin area, that, that we, may be, we may think we're getting away with something when we're actually sowing seed and, and it, the crop may come up in our children. That scares me. The crop may come up in our children. The, the bad decisions I made as a teenager and as a young adult and, 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 and as a father, the bad decisions I made, I'm planting seeds. And it, the, 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 I may be planting these seeds in the hearts of my children, in the hearts of the future generation. That's the law of sowing and reaping. You reap what you sow, reap more than you sow, you reap later than you sow, you reap in proportion to what you sow. Go to verse 9. It says, and let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. What a great promise. Do you, are, you, are you giving it? You're all serving the Lord? Are you, are you trying to do your best to, to do what's right and to, to, to be the right kind of mother and to be the right kind of father and to be the right kind of Christian and to be right, the right kind of worker out in the world? The Bible says, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. That's a promise. What God is saying is don't quit. If you're doing well, if you're doing what's right, and, and, it's, and it's a struggle for you, don't quit. In due season, ye shall reap if you faint not. God doesn't want you to quit. Don't be weary in well-doing. If you're doing well, if you're doing what's right, and, and the pressure's against you, you go to the Lord and ask the Lord, Lord, give me more grace. Give me more fuel. I, lo I love that, that illustration from Paul Bun uh, John Bunyan's uh, Pilgrim's Progress. Where, where he go, the uh, pilgrim, he, he, he's now Christian. He goes into the interpreter's house, and the interpreter is showing him different things in the house. And if I, I would highly recommend you get the audio book of that or read, read the book of Pilgrim's Progress. The audio book is, is, is amazing. You can put it in there and listen to it as you're going down the road. But there's a, there's a scene in the interpreter's house where, where he comes across uh, this, this scene of a fireplace. And on the one side, this one man is throwing water on the fire. But every time he throws water on the fire, the fire flashes higher. And, and, and Christian, the, 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 the main character, he's like, how is that possible? This is water. Water is supposed to douse the fire. And the interpreter says, let me show you the other side of the wall. And so he takes him to the other side of the wall, and he noticed that every time... That this man on the, this side would throw water on the fire. This other man on the other side would put oil on the fire. And he says, this guy over here is a picture of Satan trying to douse the work of grace in your heart. But every time the work of grace is, is attempted to be doused, Jesus, he puts the oil of your grace, the oil of his grace, and he puts more oil in the fire, and it causes it to rise higher. And that's what God wants us to understand. Don't quit. Don't be weary in well-doing, for in due season ye shall reap if we faint not. And sometimes we need to go to the Lord and say, the Lord, I feel like Satan is trying to, to, to douse this, this work of grace that you're doing in my heart. Put more oil of grace upon my fire. Keep that fire strong. That's a promise to us. Verse 10, let's look that, at that one. It says, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. He's trying to teach us here that we should have a loose handle on the things that are in our hand. Have a loose hold on the things that are in our hand. Acts says, the Lord Jesus taught that it is more blessed to give than to receive. He says, do good unto them, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. What is he trying to teach us there? He's trying to teach us to be generous. You know, the perfect opportunity for us to be generous is when these missionaries come through. Yeah. It's for us to just be generous and just be generous. Make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness. Use the mammon of unrighteousness. Use the worldly wealth to make to yourselves friends that you will meet in heaven one day. I love that, that song about uh, I dreamed I went to heaven and, and uh, I saw the sights of heaven. And then the chorus goes, thank you for giving to the Lord. All these people came and met this person in heaven that he had never met because he gave to missions. And he gave, he was generous, especially to those of the household of faith. That would be missionaries. Amen. And it multiplied into souls up in heaven. 
But he's teaching us to be there, to, 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 to do that, to, to do good unto all men. Trust God with your finances. This chapter is packed with truths. The one I want to concentrate on today is found in verse 1. Verse 1 says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one. In the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. That word overtaken means to catch, to take by surprise. On Wednesdays, I'm, I'm here at the church and uh, you know, other days as well, but Wednesday especially, uh, when I go downstairs, I have to make some noise. Like if I start coming down the stairs, I have to whistle or something because there's a, there's a certain lady that works in the office that if I just pop around the corner, she'll jump out of her chair and scream. And <laughs> <laughs> so I have to, I try, I, I don't, I need her help. So I don't need her in the hospital with a heart attack. I need her in the office helping me out. So I try to try not to cause any heart attacks around here. Amen, Miss Bunny. So, so I don't want to surprise her. I don't want to scare her. Sometimes my wife's the same way. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be in the, come in the, uh, in, the, in the bedroom, and then she'll be in the closet, and i, I got to make some noise, let, let her know, hey, you know, somebody's coming, somebody's coming, or else she'll come right out of the closet, ah! and scare her. It's like, I don't want to scare her. It's like, just... But that word overtaken means to, to catch, to take by surprise. And the Bible says, if a man be overtaken in a fault, that word, that word fault means an erring, a failing, a mistake, a blunder, a defect, a blemish, a slight offense, a neglected duty. How many times have we been overtaken in a fault? All the time. All the time. If we think about Moses. Moses, a child that was born during the time of when Egypt was aborting all their babies, aborting their male children, they were throwing them into the Nile River. He should have been aborted. There was abortion going on back in the Bible days. Even in the pagan countries, there was abortion going on. He should have died, but the Lord saved him. And the Lord, his mother taught him in those times, that, that those years that he was, he was being weaned before he went to, the, to Pharaoh's daughter's uh, uh, palace to be taught in the schools of Egypt. There was a time that, the Lord, that his mother indoctrinated him. Hey, you are special. God has saved you for a purpose. And somehow, some way, some way he held on to that up until the time he was 40 years old. Because at 40 years old, it says that he went to go see his countrymen, his people. And he saw an Egyptian mistreating one of his countrymen, and he slew the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. And the next day he goes out, and he wants to go visit them again. And he sees a Jew or a Hebrew and a Hebrew, and they were mistreating each other, and he tries to be a peacemaker. And one of them says, hey, are you going to kill me like you did that Egyptian yesterday? <gasps> Moses realized he's been found out. You see, Moses was a murderer. That was his fault. He was overtaken in a fault. I hear the story of David that one day where all of his armies went out to battle, but he stayed home. And at eventide, he was walking on the roof of his house and he saw something that he shouldn't have seen. He made some inquiries. He started asking some questions, some some notes were passed, some information was passed back and forth, and he ended up committing adultery. He ended up also getting this lady pregnant and then having to try to cover it up. So he calls her husband in and tries to get him drunk and tries to get him to go home and, and to, to, to be with his wife, but he would not. He stayed there at the door of the palace. And finally, he had to write some instructions, and he sealed those instructions. He gave it to the, to the, to the husband and said, go back to, the, go back to the army, go back to battle. And in that paper, this man, this man was so honorable, he didn't even look at his own death warrant. He did not even open it up and say, what, what, did, what, did this, what does this say? This, this note that he was carrying said, hey, put this guy at the hottest battle 
And then everybody retreat from him and leave him there to be killed by the enemy. That's what that note said. That this man carried from his commander-in-chief to his general. Yet he was so honorable that he never even looked at it. But David, he committed adultery and then he committed murder by the hand of another person. Jonah, he was called of God to go to Nineveh and preach to Nineveh. But Jonah, sadly, he rebelled against God's will. He said, you want me to go over here, God? I'm going this way. Because I'm not going to these people. I've heard some really bad people. These, these folks are terrorists over there, and I'm not going to go and sacrifice my life for these guys. They just need to, they just need to be wiped off. Because I know you're a God of grace and you, you, you're so tenderhearted that if they got saved, you'd forgive them and all the atrocities that they've caused us, they'd be forgiven for and no justice would be served. So I'm going this way. You can send somebody else. And God said, oh, 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 really? Oh, really? Oh, really? Okay. I'll send a little storm your way. And then I'll have them throw you out in the, in the water and then I'll have a little fish eat. And this little, little, this little, little guppy is going to swallow you and it's going to bring you all the way back. And we're going to go over this again. But his fault was to rebel against God's will. You know the story of Elijah, how Elijah, he had that time where he had the, the 450 prophets of Baal and he had this challenge up on the mountain and, and, and he let them go first. Hey, you know, you try to call fire down from heaven and you try to get the, your God, Baal, to, 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 to consume the fire and the, the God who consumes our fire, that's going to be the God that we serve. And so they spent all day or, or half the day they were, they were calling and Elijah was sitting there mocking them. Hey, maybe he's sleeping. Hey, maybe he's on vacation. Hey, hey, you know, do you have his cell phone number? Maybe, maybe you know, he's disconnected. He, he doesn't have roaming out where he is in the universe, wherever. And then finally, Elijah sets this altar back up. He repairs the altar. He builds a trench around it. He dumps 12 barrels of water, which was very rare. It hadn't rained in three and a half years. And he dumps 12 barrels, one for each tribe on this sacrifice just to convince the folks that if God consumes this by fire, it's got to be him. And it's, there's no fire hidden under this altar. There's no tricks. And God does it. Great victory. Great victory. And then he then decapitates the head of all these prophets. You look at the next chapter. And then Jezebel finds out what he did. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them, the prophets of Baal, by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, this is Elijah, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he, went himself, he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat under a juniper tree, and he requested him for himself that he might die. He just had this great victory. What was his fault? He got depressed, and he was self-centered. If you read what he, what he was conversing with God about, he was saying to God, God, I'm the only one left. God, I'm the only one left. He had the wrong perspective, and that was his fault. You think about Peter. Peter, we were talking about yesterday morning in the, in the, uh, in the bus meeting, but, but Peter, he was always the one who would open his mouth first before his brain would engage and, and, and boot up. You know, have you ever had those computers that, that, that you push the power button and then you go do something for about 30 minutes and then come back and it's thinking about turning on? I've had computers like that. Well, Peter's brain was a little bit that way. His mouth was really fast, but his brain was a little slow to catch up. And he, and he was the one who, who, when Jesus said, I'm going to go to Jerusalem and they're going to crucify me and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die. And Jesus said, uh, Peter said, no, you're not. No, no. And Jesus had to say, get thee behind me, Satan. This is why I came. And Peter said, I I'm willing to go die with you, Jesus. And Jesus said, before the cock crows tonight, you'll deny me three times. In Matthew 26, it talks about Peter. It says, he began to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man. And immediately the cock crew. What was Peter's fault? He denied Christ three times. He denied Christ. Then you have Saul. This is before he was saved and became the Apostle Paul. He was a Christian killer. He was an enemy of the church. He was a, he was a terrorist of his day. 
He went to Damascus to go hail the Christians and, and to persecute them and bring them back to Jerusalem and put them in jail. He was a Christian killer. God tells us here in Galatians chapter 6 how to deal with one who is in a case like this, one who is overtaken in a fault. Let's look at verse 1 and let's break it down and let's find the directions because we're going to be crossed and we're going we're to come across people who, like that who are going to be overtaken in a fault. We need to know how to deal with these people, how to interact with them. And the Bible says, uh, ye who are spiritual, restore such an one. See, being spiritual is not saying all the Holy Mary's full of grace, swing these beads all over the plates, swing them high, swing them low, swing them merry, go, go, go. That's not being spiritual. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be done. If that's not being spiritual, see, being, God tells us, ye who are spiritual, this is what you'll be able to do. Let's look at this. Number one, he says, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual. The first direction is to be spiritual. Romans 8 says, for they that are of the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are of the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. God, uh, uh, God wants us to be spiritual. How, how, how can we be spiritual? Well, mind the things of the spirit. What are some of the things of the spirit? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness. The fruit of the Spirit. God wants us to mind those things and to develop those things and to, to have those things as what comes out in our life. He wants us to be spiritual. He wants us to, to be spirit-filled, be moved by the Spirit, to, to reflect the Spirit of Christ in everything that we do. In Ephesians 5, it says, Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making a melody in your heart to the Lord. Those are things that help us be spiritual and help us to get into that mind of being spiritual. Then he says in verse 1, he says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fall, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one. The second thing he tells us is be on the ready to restore. Be on the ready to restore. You see... Our prideful, carnal nature wants to go around thinking highly of ourselves and saying, hey, I'm spiritual. Hey, I'm spiritual. Hey, I'm spiritual. Wow, yes. I'm doing all these good works. I'm spiritual. I'm spiritual. But God says, no, no. This is, this is my definition of spirituality. Be spiritual. Be on the ready to restore. Go to the next phrase. It says, in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, be realistic. Be spiritual, be ready to restore, but be realistic considering thyself. Because it may be somebody else today, but it may be you tomorrow. Yeah. It may be you tomorrow that is overtaken in a fault, that the Satan, the Bible says, and having, and having done all to stand, that you may be able to stand in the evil day in Ephesians 6. There's coming an evil day where Satan is going to unload all the forces of heaven, all the forces of hell upon you and try to get you to fall. You don't know when that day is. I don't know when that day is. Nobody knows when that day is yeah. or that time frame in your life. So it may be somebody else today, but you tomorrow. Right. So you, so you, so you want to you wanna be realistic considering yourself. Ye who are spiritual restore someone who's over, been overtaken in a fall because it could be you tomorrow. Then he says, lest thou also be tempted, be ready for it to come to you. Be ready for it to come to you. To restore means to return to a person as a specific thing which he has lost or which has been taken from him and unjustly detained. To replace to return, to bring back, to bring back or recover from ruin to its former state, to revive, to resuscitate. From God's perspective, this is what rest restoration is. It's returning the relationship to its former state, yet not harboring bitterness or unforgiveness or animosity against the guilty. But also included is this. Not delighting in the future consequences that may arise because of the past wrong, but instead 
helping the formerly guilty party through the consequences by your presence, effort, and support, being his yoke mate. That's what God looks at restoration is, is not, you think about a court case. In the court, you have the judge, you have the, the prosecutor, you have the one, the defendant. Then you have the jury. And God says, we have somebody who has offended the law. And so they come and they make their case and the jury, what, what is their job to do? Their job is to review the evidence. And somebody has wronged you and, and the evidence is against them. And, and God says, the restoration is this. If you cannot restore, this is what you're doing. You are taking the evidence. The case has been closed. The case has been dismissed. The case has been, uh, everything's been taken care of. But you stay in that jury box and you continue reviewing the evidence long after the case has been cared for and closed. Oh, I can't. Yeah, yeah, he did that. Oh, my goodness. I can't believe that. Oh, my goodness. Just, and you can constantly review the evidence and review the evidence and review the evidence. That's, that's a person who cannot, re, that's not restoring, who doesn't have that ability to restore. It's because they keep reviewing the evidence. Yeah. And God says, you know what? Close the book on it. Close the book on it. Let it go. I did the same for you. I did the same for you. I'm not up there looking at all the evidence. I mean, I even forgave your future sins. Hello. On the cross, I forgave your sins, but then also your future sins. The ones that after you're saved that you keep committing. Yeah. After I did all this for you. But I don't review the evidence against you. I close the book. It's under the blood. It's under the blood. Do the same. That's restoration. It's under the blood. Get out of the jury box. Stop reviewing the evidence. From God's perspective, re restoration is re returning the relationship to its former state. But in returning... Well, I'm going to forgive that person. I'll restore that person, but I'll never forget them. You haven't restored them. You have not restored them. It's in the spirit of weakness, considering yourself. If you make the same mistake, do you want somebody to, to be reviewing the evidence and always hold that over your head? Yeah, there you go. I'm glad that God doesn't. For, rest, for, for Moses, his fault was murder. Restoration for him was a voice from a burning bush calling to him to go back to Egypt and to finally liberate God's people, this time by God's power. He shouldn't have been used. He was a murderer. But God said, I'm going to restore you. For David, his fault was adultery and murder. But his restoration was a confrontation by the prophet Nathan, the prophet calling him out for his sin, David confessing the horrors of his action, but God still allowing him to be king. And that was his restoration. For Jonah, he rebelled against God's will. But God's restoration for Jonah was being vomited up by a well on the beach, being commissioned a second time to go to Nineveh, and he did it. The well was actually a work of restoration as well as correction for Jonah. Elijah, he got depressed and self-centered. He, he had the wrong perspective. He thought he was the only one left. He was the last one. God told him in that cave, he said, Elijah, you're not the last one. There are 7,000 who haven't bowed their knees to Baal. I have preserved unto me 7,000. You're not, you're not non-expendable. I can raise somebody else up to do the work that I have asked you to do. You're not my answer to, to my message. And so restoration was for God to give him the right perspective. For Peter, he denied Christ three times. But, but I love what Peter, what Jesus said to Peter, or Jesus said to the ladies at the tomb. He says, I go before you to Galilee. Go tell the disciples and Peter. Why didn't he say all the other, the, the, the other disciples' names? They didn't deny him. It was Peter who denied him. And so he wanted Peter to know, I'm, I, I want to restore you. I want to restore you. And so in John 21, we find that three times Jesus asks Peter, do you love me? And three times Jesus tells Peter, feed my lambs. Feed my lambs. I got a job for you. I want to restore you. I want to let bygones be bygones. I want to let it go. I don't want to hold this against you. Let's, let's just go on. For Saul, 
the Christian killer, the enemy of the church, his restoration was being blinded on the road to Damascus, then, be, then going to Damascus where he was forgiven by God and given a job from God to do, to be a light to the Gentiles. It is impossible for you to go through life and neither either and not either commit a fault or have somebody around you be overtaken in a fault. When that happens and someone is overtaken in a fault, remember that he says to be spiritual. Be ready to restore. Be realistic. Be ready for it to come to you. God's perspective on restoration is returning that relationship to its former state, but not harboring bitterness, unforgiveness, and animosity against the person who did wrong. But how many times we say, okay, I'll return it to the former state, and I won't be bitter against them. But if they got problems, I, I'm not lifting a finger to try to help them through. Does God do that with you? Does God do that when you make bad, when you make bad decisions? Does God make you waller in it? I, hey, you're my child. You should, have, you should have consulted my word. You didn't pray and ask me, but and you're wallering in this, the, the consequences of your bad decision. I'm just going to watch you writhe in pain. No, his grace comes down puts his arms around you, and picks you up. He restores you. And so that's what his idea is that even in the future consequences, there may be decisions that were made that, 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 that pfft, you're going you're gonna to suffer the consequences, but God doesn't hold it against you. He gets in there in the yoke with you in those consequences and say, hey, I'm going to suffer them with you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to get in the yoke with you. What a great God we have, Amen. What a great God. And that sums up God's perspective of restoration. Jesus gave you restoration when he saved you and he wants you to do the same for others. I love the story of Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth was the grandson of David's former enemy. The grandson of David's former enemy. But he was also the son of of David's friend. And Mephibosheth was of the previous line of kings. And if you know anything about royalty, they typically take the old line and they exterminate them so there's no competition of the throne. But David said, I want to show a kindness. I want to show a kindness to my friend Jonathan, the son of my former enemy. And he said, I want to show kindness. And that's exactly what God did to us. Mephibosheth, when he, when he was uh, whisked away as a young boy, his nurse fell and broke his leg and made him lame for the rest of his life. So he couldn't walk. He, he had to be helped around and had to have a servant. And that's just like us. We've, been, we've fallen. We, we, we're, we're, we're enemies uh, of God and, and, and we have fallen into sin. But Jesus says, you know what? I want to show a kindness. I want to bring you and I want you to eat at my table again. I want to restore you to your royal position, even though you're crippled. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If restoration is something that you can achieve, then you have the right to call or think of yourself as spiritual. I'm practicing to be spiritual. But until then, you'd be like the doctor and say, I'm practicing. I'm practicing medicine. Yeah. He says, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one. Be on the ready to restore. If you are able to restore, then the world will come to its own conclusion about you and they will call you spiritual. You see, spiritual isn't something you call yourself. It's something what other people call you. Until then, be ready to restore. Keep practicing. Keep practicing. Keep practicing. How, do you, how can you be ready to restore? Keep, be spiritual. Be spirit-minded. Mind the things of the spirit, not the things of the flesh. Look at the fruit of the spirit and ask the Lord, please develop these, these qualities in me. Be ready to restore. Be realistic. It could be you tomorrow. 
I love what my, my friend John Tutton said in high school. We had a, we had a, a situation in high school where, where a lot of the, the kids in the high school got expelled from the school. And one day after we were in school, he said, you know what? That, by the grace of God, it could be us. You see somebody fall into something, you need to step back and say, you know what? By the grace of God, it could have been me. Yeah. It could have been me. And keep that perspective. Keep that humble perspective. Because Satan may, Satan may just be putting all his attacks and focus on that person right now. But you may be next on his list. Be careful. Be ready for it to come to you. We need, always need to be on the ready to restore. Because we never know when it's going to come to us. Don't be so quick to judge another. And if somebody is overtaken, ye who are spiritual, be ready to restore. Be ready to restore. Heavenly Father, we praise and thank you, Lord, for this time that you've given us to hear from your word. I pray, Lord, you please help us, Lord, to, to grow in this grace of restoration. Lord Jesus, I, I praise and thank you, Lord, that you've given us restoration. You've restored us through your blood, through, through your righteousness being put on our account. You've restored us to that former Glory, you said, you said one day we'll, we'll receive that glory. And it's all because of you. Lord, help us to turn around to those around us and help us, Lord, to apply that as well. Lord, this is, this is tough to live. It's tough to live. But if we can do that, the world will see that we are controlled by Christ and not our carnal flesh. We mind the things of the spirit and not the things of the flesh. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I want to ask you a couple questions and we'll have an invitation. I want to ask you, if you know for sure that when you die today, if you were to die today, if you would go to heaven, are you 100% for sure that if you were to die today, that you would go to heaven? You say, Pastor, I have accepted Christ as my Savior. I know Jesus is my Savior. I know that if I were to die today, I would go to heaven. Would you raise your hand as a testimony that you know for sure that when you die today, or if you die today, that you would go to heaven? You say, Pastor, I have accepted Christ as my Savior. You may put your hands down. You say, Pastor, I don't know for sure. Now, my friend, if, 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 if you've prayed and trusted Christ as your Savior, remember God's promises. Where he says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God's not going to break one of his promises. And if you have fulfilled the requirements of salvation and you've called on Jesus with all your heart, as best as you know how, the Bible says you're saved. If you, if you say, Pastor, I do not know for sure that when I die that I'm going to go to heaven. I'm, I've, I've got a little bit of doubt. Would you please pray for me? If that's your case, if you would, right where you are, just raise your hand. I won't embarrass you. Amen. Heavenly Father, I praise and thank you, Lord, for this opportunity that you've given us. I pray, Lord, that those who are struggling with this, their, their salvation or security, Lord, that they would, they would realize, Lord, that your promises are true and all they've got to do is embrace them and believe them with all their heart. There's no magic feeling. There's, there's no warm glow that comes over a person it's just a matter of deciding i'm going to believe i'm going to believe in god i'm going to trust his promises i'm going to believe that they are true well please help us lord to live with that assurance so that we can grow in the lord i pray lord you please help us as christians help us lord to be ready for these times when others will offend us when others will do wrong help us lord to be ready to restore Lord, help us to be working at being spiritual, minding the things of the Spirit. Help us to, to, to be on the ready to restore. Help us, Lord, to be, to be realistic and realize, hey, the tables could be turned. Lord, we need to be ready. Let's all stand, please. I'm going to have Miss Melissa play a hymn of invitation. I encourage you to come and use the altar. Ask the Lord to, to be working on your heart. And if there's anybody that you need to make things right with, that you would, that you would do what you have to do and get the help that you, that you, that you need, to be able to get them that relationship restored. God wants that. He wants you to have that peace in your heart. Let's pray.
morning. Richard Bartlett got saved yesterday and he's coming to be baptized. But I want to ask a question. If, have you been saved? Have you accepted Christ as your Savior? Have you been baptized afterwards? It's a, it's a step, a very important step. It's the answer of a good conscience. I believe that God is, God, when we get to heaven, he's going to ask us, hey, have you trusted Christ? Have you trusted my son, Jesus, as your Savior? Okay. Well, then, did you get baptized? He got baptized. Not to be saved but to represent the death, burial, and resurrection. Did you get baptized? And if you've not been baptized, you're, gonna, you're not going to have a good conscience before God. He says, you need to get baptized. Jesus did it. You need to follow his, his example. So if that's a question, then feel free to come and ask me and talk, talk to me about it. If you've got any questions about it, get that settled. Get that settled. And this morning, we have Richard Bartlett, and he's coming, making a profession of faith, and uh, going to be getting baptized in a little bit. So... Brother Bunny, would you come and lead us into some songs while uh, we get ready? Or somebody, Brother Mike, could you come and lead us in a few songs? I'm sorry. All right, Brother Mike's can come and lead us in a song. So y'all can go ahead and be seated, and he will announce the songs while I get ready. All right, surprise. <laughs> yep, all right, let me find a song here. I've done this a few times, so we'll do this and we'll just have fun. How about that? Um, but I have to find a song that I'm somewhat familiar with because if I don't, you all will spend your time laughing at me while I'm up here attempting to sing. You know, when you're not looking for a song, you're all over the place. <clears throat> what page? All right, let's make sure I know this song. Okay, 64. Page 64. We will sing that one. Good call, Mr. Thomas. All right. Shall we?
55, I know that one. All right, page 55. <laughs> Page 56.